participants welcome back to lecture number 6 of this 10 days lecture series on history of american literature today we have among us uh, dr emma a very good friend of mine she is a lecturer of english in uh, college of international education in hong kong baptist university her research interest include uh, comparative literature and comparative mythology she has written on the subjects of contemporary asian american literature chinese myth mythology as well as life writing and uh, most interestingly uh, she is developing skills in e learning and virtual exchange and she is presently into virtual exchange and in 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 progress and uh, she oh, she is very kind to invite us also and we are also part of that virtual exchange program uh, some of you all might have heard dr emma before and uh, for for those who haven't heard her i can assure you that we are in for a very engaging session dr emma on behalf of team dad voyage and uh, nosis it's an absolute pleasure and honor to have you thank you so much for accepting our invitation and we welcome you and we are so happy to see you as well and thank you for taking on this challenge again and speaking to our heterogeneous group of participants uh thank you uh, on behalf of team dad voyage and uh, over to you dr emma thank you so much dr banerji for your kind introduction and for having me again this is the third time i'm working with dr banerji on the dad voyage uh, series and i also like to take this opportunity to express my appreciation for dr banerji um, to bring his students to join this year's so virtual exchange and i look forward to uh, future collaborations as well and um uh students who are here tonight uh please do um look out for uh ideas and opportunities that i will be offering in the future to put you in touch with uh students in other parts of the world uh so tonight our topic is the realist school and the subtopic um the, the the subtitle that i borrowed uh, actually came from a 2011 uh of american literary history book <clears throat> where i'm getting a lot of uh, uh ideas from the writer of the book is uh richard gray <laughs> this is a book here um so basically the reason i'm using this book to help us map out this period of american literature history is because uh actually in recent years when we study history our um perspective tend to change uh today in america the perspective in uh, studying history is more inclusive uh for example quite a lot of historians has began the um uh basically trend or perspective of studying the people's history so that's why when we look at history of literature we also um Uh, begin to make this perspective a bit more inclusive in that uh we will not only look at the um what is traditionally understood as um american literary uh, classical icons when we look at this period it is equally important to look at the voices of the dang chou den so tonight when we talk about the realist school i am going to bring you voices not only of the great mark twain or uh, henry james or uh, what witman uh, we will hear a lot of voices from female writers and also from writers of other ethnicity so first uh why do we call this period the realist school uh what we are looking at in terms of historical period is national trauma because america went through a very bloody civil war from uh 1861 to 1865 and during these four year period um 
360,000 Union soldiers and 260,000 Confederate soldiers' lives were lost on the battlefield. So we can imagine uh, just how traumatic this war uh, had been on America. And on the way, American people understand their identity, their racial relations, and also their understanding of um, divinity of God. So apart from this uh, uh, national trauma, that serves as the backdrop of the period that we're looking at, uh, we should also um, notice that after the war, America uh, economically recovered uh, extremely rapidly. Uh, this was also the period of um, what should we call it, other than American empirical expansion because um, the economic power of America developed um, rapidly. America went through its second industrial uh, revolution, which made it possible for the nation to produce incredible wealth. And America became uh, one of the major world powers and began to play an important role on the international stage. So all of these changes are reflected in the literature that we're going to look at. So tonight we will begin our journey with Mark Twain, who is then and today recognized as the father of American literature, who wrote the great American novel, Huckleberry Finn. But one irony of this is that the novel that he wrote was banned during the time that it was first published and it is still banned today. Uh, I don't know whether you have read the novel, but I believe it's a good representation of uh, the real, what we call the realist school. So the reason we call the literature in this period as a realist school is because writers begin to observe the way people live and talk in America. Uh, in other words, the lifestyle in America has became for the first time a worthwhile literary subject to be documented by writers and poets. And Mark Twain, who uh, was from, um, he was from the West. So last night we learned a lot about the transcendentalists, the Thoreau and uh, Emerson. They are from the up north, right? They're the Boston gentlemen. They're very um, well-educated, sophisticated, laced up. Mark Twain is a completely different and refreshing voice compared to the Boston School of uh, Transcendentalist Scholars. So uh, that's part of the reason why his novel were first recognized the, the, uh, as the American story, as the American novel, because he wrote uh, his stories in the um, vernacular language that was spoken in the um, Mississippi area where Huckleberry Finn was set. And another um, interesting aspect of his novel is that he created this uh, young idealized American hero, Huck, who is full of tricks, who does not trust his education. Uh, so from the transcendentalist school of thoughts, um, perhaps if you still remember our lecture last night, there is a um, sort of a suspicion against the established institutions. Um, I remember our lecture talked about how religion became more spiritual and more personal and people no longer trusted um, uh, institutionalized religious practice. And the same thing sort of happened with education as well. 
Um, so earlier on when I was talking with Dr. Banerjee, um, before our lectures started, Dr. Banerjee was actually having a very serious exactly what Mark Twain dealt with when he wrote Huckleberry Finn. And those of you who's read the book, perhaps you recognize this passage from chapter 31, when Huck went through a long period of self-reflection where he was struggling with his conscience. And his conscience has told him what he did, which was freeing the, 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 the uh, African-American man, Jim, um, from the slave owner and helping him escape down the Mississippi River was wrong, was the wrong thing to do if he does not take Jim back to his master, then um, he is going to go to hell. So in chapter 31, Hug wrote a letter to his old friend, Tom Sawyer, and he was ready to send that letter to tell people of the town where Jim is so that he can be returned to his rightful owner. But at this important moment, Hug began to remember all of the adventures he had with Jim down the Mississippi River, the father and son and friend-like relationship they have built. And as he was looking back, he was thinking to himself and he remembered this moment by, at last I struck the time I saved him by telling the man we had smallpox abroad and he was so grateful and said, I was the best friend old Jim ever had in the world. And the only one he's got now. And then I happened to look around and see that paper. That paper is a letter that he wrote to betray Jim, to take him back to his owner. It was a close place. I took it up and held it in my hand. I was a trembling because I'd got to decide forever between two things and I know it. I studied a minute sort of holding my breath and then thus to myself, all right, then I'll go to hell and tore it up. So here, what is this struggle? Huck is actually struggling between his intuition as a boy who is quite naughty, um, but has a golden heart and his education. So this chapter today, perhaps it should tell us no matter which society we live in, the structure that we are put into the education system that we belong to is also built to perpetuate the logic to uphold the social structure that we're in today. I don't know whether my students from mainland China are here tonight, uh, but if you were a child who's educated in mainland China in the last two decades, your education is designed for you to uphold ideas that would support an authoritarian government. You will not be taught to question it. The same way as Huck was educated in a system that supported slavery, where the, 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 the betrayal of a friend was the right thing according to his education and the helping and the loyalty that he has shown here to his friend Jim is something will condemn him to hell. So this is the beginning of American literature. And Mark Twain is asking us, can we break free from this social structure, this education system, this cultural 
um, conception that we're brought into, we're born into, can we completely break free from it? And the American novel, um, to a great extent, is the search for the possibility of breaking free from institutions. And because the writers we're looking at tonight are realists and not romanticists, they never found an answer. Because a question like this, if you look at the reality of life, the answer for it is disappointing. This is why we have Huck and Jim traveling down the Mississippi River, never going anywhere, because Twain had never found an answer for that. The next writer we're going to look at is Walt Whitman. But before we read Whitman's poetry, I'd like to take you a step back to the scholar whom we met last night, that is Ralph Waldo Emerson. In 1844, Emerson wrote an essay titled The Poet, and it's a beautiful long essay. Had I thought of it beforehand, I would have linked the entire essay here, uh, but perhaps I can add that later and share it with you. You can find it online, the whole thing is available. Um, but he basically wrote a long and beautiful essay describing what a poet is. And as a man of letters, he's very different from the politicians that we're living with today and the policy makers who decide where funding goes. Uh, again, Dr. Banerjee and I, before I started my lecture tonight, we were chatting about how today, if you study humanities, how hard it is to get funding. Um, not so in Ralph Waldo Emerson's age. Emerson saw the poet as a prophet, as someone who is a genius, who can um, write the song of his age and become the collective conscious of that age. And toward the end of this essay, he said, I look in vain for the poet whom I describe. We do not, with sufficient plainness or sufficient profoundness, address ourselves to life, nor dare we chant our own times and social circumstance. If we fill the day with bravery, we should not shrink from celebrating it. Time and nature yield us many gifts, but not yet the timely man, the new religion the reconciler whom all things await. Dante's praise is that he dared to write his autobiography in colossal cipher or into universality. We have yet had no genius in America with tyrannous eye, which knew the value of our incomparable materials. So, he wrote this in 1844. He was looking for an American poet. And I would say in 1855, he found his poet. And that is Walt Whitman, who did not actually ever had a formal education, which was to Whitman's benefit because his language was completely fresh. His vision was explosive and nobody has ever done poetry the way he did it. And this has a lot to do with the fact that he was not formally schooled. So he has a liberty to discover his own voice and his voice became the voice of America that Emerson prophesied. So here, let's take a look at Whitman's Song of Myself, which is one of the longest poems in um, Leave of Grass. The reason I say Emerson's uh, um, American poet appeared in 1855 is because um, 
when Whitman first published with uh, Leaves of Grass, uh, the collection had only 13 poems. He published it himself. He paid for the expenses himself. Everybody rejected. Um, but as our lecturer last night have mentioned, Whitman also sent a copy to Emerson, who loved it and recognized Whitman's genius. And in the second copy, uh, when Whitman published his Leaf of Grass again, he used the private letter of Emerson um, in the binding of his book to as a way to promote it. But Whitman actually did not finish this collection of poetry um, until 1891, the year before he passed away. And by the time we got that final version, his 13th um, poem collection has grown into something like over 300 poems were collected now in Leaves of Grass. Uh, the version that we're looking at tonight is the 1892 version. So it's the finalized version. And the first bit I will read for you is uh, the section labeled 24. Uh, in this part, Whitman um, introduces himself for the first time in this song of myself, Walt Whitman, a cosmos of, of Manhattan, the sun, turbulent, fleshy, sensual, eating, drinking, and breeding, right? No sentimentalist, no standard above men and women or apart from them, no more modest than immodest. And screw the locks from the doors and screw the doors themselves from their jabs. Whoever degrades another degrades me. Whoever is done or said return at last to me. Through me, the aphotons surging and surging. Through me, the current and the index. I speak the password primeval. I give the sun of democracy. By God, I will accept nothing which all cannot have their counterpart of on the same terms. So here he declared himself the poet of democracy and he elevates everyone and everything. And he is the breaker down of doors. Uh, throughout his life, again, this, his case is quite similar to Mark Twain's. His works were banned. Like I said, leaves of grass were not accepted by any critic of his time when it was first published. Even Whitman's own brother did not bother to read it. And even late in his life, he had trouble publishing this uh, collection of poetry with the Boston crowd, the, you know, the group of very sophisticated, well-educated Boston gentlemen uh, literati. Uh, when Whitman tried to publish Leaves of Grass there, the, uh, the, the, the court then listed a long list of verses that should be censored and taken out of the collection and Whitman refused. Um, so uh, this highlights the fact that Whitman is a completely fresh and new voice compared to uh, his uh, literary um, forefathers. He's a, a you know, a person who broke free from that literary tradition, who, um, you know, basically forged his own path. And that is why he became the voice of America that is distinct and different from that of Europe. Um, so why was Whitman's poetry censored? One of the reasons, um, 
that a lot of these sophisticated laced up gentlemen had the trouble appreciating Whitman's poem is because of the way he wrote about sexuality and the way he celebrated the human body. So now I invite you to read section 11 of Song of Myself where he writes 28 young men bathed by the shore, 28 young men all so friendly, 28 years of womanly life and all oh, so lonesome. She owns the fine house by the rise of the bank. She hides handsome and richly dressed after the blends of the window. Which of the young men does she like the best? Ah, the homeless of them is beautiful to her. Where are you off to, lady? For I see you, you splash in the water there, yet stay stuck in your room. Perhaps you, you can guess why I picked this poem as a woman. I find it refreshing because this poem in words is a gaze. Too often I see poetry describes the female body um, as the object of the male gaze. And here we have a female gazer who stands <laughs> behind her house and gaze behind her window. Well, imagining being with these 28 bathing men. So that's, that's why the poem is really refreshing to me. And uh, as a poem develops, right, we say dancing and laughing along the beach came the 29th bather. The rest did not see her, but she saw them and loved them. The rest of the poem is a description of the woman enjoying these beautiful men in her imagination because the poet already told us her body stays still behind the window, behind the curtains, but her mind has flown to the place where the 28 young men are basing. So, so this again, I find is not only refreshing, but also quite accurate because quite a lot of sober human sexuality actually do not take place in the body, but takes place in our imagination. And Whitman is perhaps the first poet who captured that in this poem. And finally, um, I'd like to share with you uh, the section 48 from Song of Myself. And here we are looking at how Whitman addresses religion. So last night we learned quite a lot about the distrust and the rejection of organized religion and religious institutions. And Whitman is the perfect bard for that transcendentalist um, idea. So here he writes, I have said that the soul is not more than the body. And I have said that the body is not more than the soul and nothing, not God is greater to one than oneself is. And whoever walks a furlong without sympathy walks to his own funeral, dressed in his shroud, or I, uh, and I or you, pocketless of a dime, may purchase the pick of the earth and to glance with an eye or show a being in its pot confounds the learning of all times. And there is no trade or employment, but the young man following it may become a hero. And there is no object so soft, but it makes a hub for the weird universe. And I say to any man or woman, let your soul stand cool and composed before a million universes. And I say to mankind, be not curious about God, for I, who I am curious about each, I am not curious about God. No array of terms can say how much I am at peace about God and about death. I hear 
and behold God in every object, yet understand God not in the least. No more do I understand who there can be more wonderful than myself. So remember, uh, our lecture last night reminded us that transcendentalism is about rejecting organized religion, including that concept of God being separated and um, divine and distant, but rather look for the God within that each of us has the capacity to know God if we get to know ourselves. So this is one of the uh, reason why uh, Whitman became the American poetic voice, the bard that Emerson profited because he realized it in his poetry. He depicted this new um, philosophy, new religion, new understanding of spirituality in this poem. And that was, of course, considered blasphemous by many in his day. That's why the greatest American literature all came out first as banned works. And in the case of Mark Twain, his work still is banned. Um, so now we go to Emily Dickinson, who in every aspect was Whitman's opposite. Whitman was a guy with flowing beard, very attractive uh, appearance, traveled everywhere. He was born in on Long Island. He went to Manhattan with his family. He worked in New Orleans. He's been all over the place. Uh, but Emily Dickinson spent all of her years in her father's Amherst mansion. And today, if you go to Massachusetts, her, her house is preserved and it's been turned into Emily Dickinson Museum. During her lifetime, she published seven poems anonymously. Um, she basically lived as a hermit. Nobody knew her and I'm not even sure when people came to her house, whether she left her room to welcome her house guests. She was uh, basically a woman that lived in complete uh, isolation from the others. Um, yet after she passed away, um, people found 1,770 something poems hidden literally in every corner of her room, in her drawers, under her bed sheets and in this and that shelf. So she was from a learned family. Um, and the woman basically lived very much in her head, but she gave us one of the most surprising and most distinct American voice. Um, and today we're still fascinated by her uh, poetry. And I would like to draw your attention to this poem called I Heard a Fly Buzz When I Died. Um, because though outwardly, Emily Dickinson is the complete opposite from Whitman who traveled everywhere, um, who you know, imagine that everybody threw himself. Emily Dickinson is completely isolated and uh, stayed in her house and never moved. But nonetheless, it's a way she thinks about religion, spirituality, death um, is quite akin to Whitman's imagination. So in this poem we read, I heard a fly buzz when I died. The stillness in the room was like the stillness in the air between the heavens of storm. The eyes around had wrung them dry and breath were gathering firm for that last onset when the king be witnessed in the room. I wrote my keepsakes, signed away, what portion of me be assignable? And then it was there interposed a fly with blue and serpent stumbling buzz between the light and me. And then the windows failed and then 
I could not see to see. How did Emily Dickinson depict this moment of death? She contrasted a moment of drama when everybody is waiting for the king to be witnessed, only to be disappointed by a fly in her ear, blocking her vision, standing between herself and the light. So death is momentous to the person dying. It is, you know, there, there's no more permanent transformation to that individual, but at the same time, it's insignificant and mundane and everyday. This is the realist school that we're talking about. There is no longer grandeur romance associated with death. Death is at least metamorphosis itself in the shape and sound of a fly in this poem. Uh, so finally, this age is not only full of new voices like Twain, like Whitman, like Emily Dickinson. We also have writers from the old school, people who are educated and sophisticated, who actually brought American literature to a level of sophistication that is unprecedented. And that person is, of course, Henry James, who was educated in Europe in his youth, who moved to London in his adult years and also purchased a house in London, kept a house in America. Um, but eventually settled in Sussex in England. Because James considered the old Europe a far more interesting place compared to the new land of America, he once said America is not really a worthy subject of fiction because there's no procedurals, uh, no class difference, unlike uh, Europe. So this is why we see in Henry James a lot of the tradition that we have already saw in Horsong, um, in Edgar Allan Poe, um, that uh, he continues to work with, for example, the gossip genre, the ghost genre, the mystery genre. But he had taken this genre to a height no other writers has done before. And uh, Henry James worked at a time when psychoanalysis was just taking Europe, um, taking over Europe. So James's most accomplished novel is called The Turn of the Screw. And of course, the title of the novel is already very suggestive um, of uh, sexual repression. But when it was pu first published in 1898, nobody read the story as a tale about sexual oppression for more than 30 years. Uh, back then, people were horrified by this story because it is about a young governess who is assigned to a, a English country house to take care of two orphans. Miles is a boy who is about 10, and Flora is a young girl who is about six years old. Their guardian, had, uh, who is a bachelor, had abandoned them and do not want to take any personal responsibility for them. So the responsibility falls on the go uh, governess. And the governess, to her horror, discovers that the uh, governess that preceded her, who had died because she had an affair with a house servant named Peter Quint and got pregnant. So the previous governess had committed suicide. Um, this new governess thinks that this two ghosts of Jessel and Quint are hunting the children and what's worse, teaching these children adult ways, teaching these children sexuality, um, teaching them to, 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 to know about sex. Um, 
uh, you know, in the dark at night during their playtime. So the governess in turn of the school try to shield and protect these innocent children. So that's why when the book was first published, people reacted with horror because they thought this is a story about children being exposed to sexual knowledge at too early an age. Um, however, in 19, um, in 1934, this is 36 years after the publication of Turn of the School. We have Edmund Wilson, who published a essay that completely changed people's interpretation of the story. Um, Wilson was the first literary critic who offered the now very um, established a Freudian reading. Today, if you watch a version of Turn of the School, the Freudian reading is the standard interpretation. Wilson's article was called The Ambiguity of Henry James. Then throughout his paper, he cited examples of the governess um, actually being crazy and the ghosts are her imagination. So the story suddenly turned into one of child abuse, where the governess um, was slowly going mad in this uh, isolated English house. And um, at the same time, her madness tortures these young children she's supposed to uh, give care for. Um, so uh, Edmund Wilson um, argues that in um, right around this time when Henry James wrote Turn of the School, Sigmund Freud also wrote about his um, study of hysteria um, and where Freud talked about this case of um, Miss, the, the case of Miss Lucy R. I linked to the entire article here if you want to um, look into it, uh, go ahead. And this is about a English governess who is secretly in love with her master whose children she was caring for. And this uh, repressed love caused her to associate burned pudding with trauma so that when she smells burned pudding, she cannot taste. So Edmund Wilson thinks that Henry James must have learned of this case and turned the story of the mad governess who is secretly in love with the master into turn of the school. Like I said, if you look at a modern um, depiction of the story um, today, uh, this, is, uh, this has become the most dominant reading. And I would like to play for you um, a scene from the TV drama made in 1999, um, where the governess goes for her interview, where she meets the master who hired her um, for the first and long, only time. And but from this moment on, she's been secretly in love with her master. And the whole story is about how she um, projects this love onto uh, the children, uh, onto those young kids she's supposed to uh, be taken care of. It looks like I'm trapped onto this YouTube channel, but I'm not sure how to go back. Um, let me see how I can exit here. So, of course, in that scene, we can imagine the governess's answer would be a thousand times yes. And according to the Wilson interpretation, from that moment on, after she met the master, she's been in love with the master. And when she took care of the children, she began to imagine 
um, the children being hunted by the former governess, Jesso, uh, Miss Jesso, who had committed suicide because of an uh, unwanted uh, pregnancy. So in this scene, uh, the governess is looking at Flora's uh, six-year-old young girl playing with uh, um, two pieces of wood. And again, this uh, scene is most frequently cited in a lot of these critiques where uh, the girl is trying to uh, fit a piece of wood into another piece that has a hole on it. Uh, so this uh, could be a very innocent play. The child could just be trying to make a boat or it could be seen as a rather sexual act. Um, so in this scene, the governess watches the child play, and she believes the child is being possessed by the dead governess who had not been very, um, uh, you know, very disciplined in her sexual conduct. Uh, so that's why the, the, the new governess imagines the dead governess is trying to corrupt the child and she thinks this is why the young girl is playing such a sexual game. Um, so after this scene, uh, the governess went to see the housekeeper, Miss Gross, and he, uh, she claims Flora saw, Flora saw the ghost of Miss Jesso. And the housekeeper had one question for her that was repeated at least three times. But how did you know she saw? And this was Wilson's evidence that no one except for the governess herself throughout the novel had ever accepted the governess version of the story. So old James is using the device of the unreliable narrator and the ghosts are just the governess's imagination. And she is having all these imaginings about sexual misconduct because she's suppressing her own sexual desire for the master. And the girl was traumatized by the governess's irrational behavior and eventually had to be taken away by Miss Gross, the housekeeper. Um, and that left the governess with uh, the young boy, Miles, alone in a room. And here we are at the end of the story where the governess is alone with Miles who is a young boy of 10 year old, handsome. And the governess, according to the Wilson's Freudian reading, had been projecting her sexual desire on this boy. So the boy is frightened of her and perceives her as a threat. But the governess nonetheless interprets the boy's drawing back from her as being under the influence of the other dead ghost to the servant, Quint. So in this final scene, the governess forces the boy to confess the fact that he has seen Quint. Um, but as Wilson had pointed out, no one except for the crazy governess herself had ever accepted uh, that they can see the ghost. So the boy, of course, is confused and uh, bewildered. Um, I'm going to play you this end scene. And this is from another version of uh, Turn of the Screws. Uh, um, the novel has been turned into a um, opera um, by Benjamin Brent, uh, Britton, one of the best composers of uh, um, England. Uh, and so in this final scene, you will uh, hear the uh, duel between the governess and the, uh, the, the, the ghost to Quint, and both of them want the boy to um, you know, be loyal to themselves. And let's hear it. 
I will forward it a bit. Here you see Flora was frightened by the governess's uh, um, mad behavior and <laughs> insisted on Miss Gross to take her away. So that's how the governess is left with the little boy. Um, Miles by herself. And in this version, you find the governess's behavior very peculiar. She let her hair down um, in the earlier scene, and now she uh, begins to sing to Miles. So there as a background, that's, that's supposed to be the ghost of Clint. So you can see from the way the actress is depicting this role, she is far from being a pauperist. She is getting too close to the young boy and her behavior is more like a lover, but at the same time, she's a woman twice as a boy's size. So if we read it uh, from this uh, Freudian reading, then the young governess uh, is a predator right, is a sexual predator. The master had left the orphans to the charge of this young woman who is sexually repressed. And she is um, basically projecting her sexual needs on a very, very uh, young boy. And that's precisely what makes this story frightening. So now I will play with you the do that's happening between the governess and the dead servant Quint. And we should keep in mind this, this tug of war is only happening in the governess's mind.
Okay, I will stop the video there. And uh, as you can see, the story ends with the death of Miles, the boy. The whole time that the governess thinks she's protecting him from the ghost of Quint. But what is she doing exactly? This is how this scene is described in the novel. Um, but he had already jerked straight around, stared, glared again, and the scene but a quiet day. So the novel ends with Miles trying to see the ghost and not being able to see it. With the stroke of the loss, I was so proud of he uttered the cry of a creature hurled over a, a beast. And the grasp with which I recovered him might have been that of catching him in his fall. I caught him, yes. I held him. It may be imagined with what a passion. So the governess is very excited that the boy, even though he did not see the ghost, nonetheless denounced the ghost for her sake. So she hugged the child with passion. But at the end of a minute, I begin to feel what it truly was that I held. We were alone with the quiet day and his little heart dispossessed had stopped. So how did Mouse die, you wonder? And I think the governess's hug may be a little bit too tight. Um, so the writer never tells us there's plenty of room in the test itself for us to imagine and interpret. Um, so this is the craft of Henry James. Nothing is explicit and the test is itself allows the richness of interpretation. His stories are puzzles and that's exactly why we still read him today. Apart from this, actually, the, 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 the horror story itself, even if we do not consider as a frightening situation where uh, two orphans are assigned to the care of an adult who she herself may be crazy, if we simply remember how the story's first audience responded to the story, the, the, the horror of innocent children being corrupted by adult sexuality, being exposed to the act of sex way too early. That still is a very real horror of our day when each and every one of our children is equipped with a smartphone. Every one of them is a few clicks away from pornography. Uh, so this uh, Henry Jameson horror is still something that parents are dealing with today. So another theme that Henry James um, invented in uh, his novel, I can't say that he invented this scene because it was Mark Twain who first wrote the Innocent Abroad story. But James certainly carried on this scene because like I said, he himself was educated in Europe and later as an adult, he resided uh, first in London, later in Sussex. So uh, one of the recurring scene in his story is this um, innocent American, often a woman like Daisy Miller, like Isabel Archer in this story, The Portrait of a Lady. A, a, a innocent, young, feisty American woman come to Europe and become corrupt by the culture of old Europe. So that is the story of the portrait of a lady. Isabel Atra is a young American woman, quite innocent, well-educated, all alone. Um, and she came across this inheritance arranged for her by her cousin Ralph. Uh, so all of a sudden she came onto Europe as this um, 
very desirable, young, attractive woman with a handsome sum of money. She literally can choose anybody to marry, but she was attracted to a man named Osmond, whom she saw as the um, quintessential European gentleman, only to find out that she he was after her money. Her marriage was deliberately arranged by Osman's former lover, Madame Nell, um, and she arranged this marriage because she saw that uh, Isabel Archer was innocent enough to, to fall for her trap, and she also has enough money to support their daughter. So uh, Isabel, how did she transform from this innocent, young, foreigner, wide-eyed young woman in love into this portrait of a lady, into this woman who recognized that her marriage was a sham and she had fallen into a trap that someone had set for her. This all happened in one moment in the novel when Isabel walked into the room and he saw uh, Madame Mel and her then husband, Osmond, in the same room. Osmond was sitting in a chair while Madame Mel was standing. The two of them were looking at each other um, with uh, intimacy that you only see in lovers. Uh, so that's the moment when she realized that the two of them had set up the marriage trap for her. And um, of course, uh, this, this became increasingly clear as the novel unfolds. So what does Isabel do as an American? She could go back to her own country, but at the end of this novel, she returns to the marriage that she recognized uh, as a trap. She was ready to accept the consequence of her choice. So that's why I put this story here as part of the realist school, um, partly because it gives us a very real and brutal picture of what marriage is. Marriage is depicted not as a, you know, a, haven for love, a consummation of, uh, of, of two white-eyed lovers of their, um, you know, uh, first love, but rather as a institution where people compete for resources. And in this story, we have, again, an inversion of the two genders. And normally, women compete with each other for a man's resource. And in this story, we have Isabel Archer, who is a desirable single bacheloress, but that makes her the hunted and the man, uh, Osmond, the hunter for her resource. So uh, no matter who you are, when you come to the marriage market, if you also offer a handsome sum of resources, you become the, the prey of the trap of this institution that's called marriage. That's James's very realistic depiction of uh, marriage for us. Marriage is a prison. What do you do with it in James's story? Isabel Archer returns to it because there's no alternative. At least she sees no alternative. She rejects any alternative to that. And what are some other women's uh, response and reaction to this? Um, I now bring you to Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who also wrote about marriage. Um, but in her day, she actually was a public intellectual. She published an enormous amount of nonfiction where she talks about women and economics, and she argues against women's economic or dependency on a man, which perhaps is why James began to imagine 
a, a bacheloress with money who is not dependent on a man, but still end up being trapped in a marriage. Uh, so we could say marriage as an institution is a trap. And once you're committed to it, uh, both man and woman, so freedom and happiness is diminished, which is exactly what uh, Charlotte uh, Perkins Human argued in her book, Woman and Economics. The, basically, if you have someone depending on someone else for their economic survival, then the happiness of both is diminished. So, uh, how did Gilman depict this uh, dimension and also advocate for the necessity of work? Today, we know Gilman best for her short story, The Yellow Wallpaper, where the uh, protagonist is prescribed a rest cure, basically means she is to stay in a room and not do any work and uh, so that her nerves can calm down. The um, inspiration for the story comes from human's own experience. She, uh, after she gave birth to her child, human experienced what we today call um, postpartum depression. So she couldn't take care of her child and she's extremely nervous. And in fact, the human herself was put through rest cure, which was part of what inspired this story. Our protagonist is told to stay in a old Victorian house. Um, uh, and she is supposed to stay in a room upstairs with hideously ugly wallpaper. Um, she wanted her husband, who is a physician who has prescribed the rest cure to her to remove the wallpaper or allow her to stay in a different room, but uh, these requests were ignored. Um, so then the woman began to lose sleep and at night she sees this woman figure trapped on the other side of the yellow wallpaper trying to get out. So our protagonist uh, says this, right? Um, he said as soon as it was noon, uh, moonlight, uh, that poor thing, that woman on the other side of the wallpaper began to call and shake the pattern. I got up and ran to help her. I pulled and she shook. I shook and she pulled. Again, this is a very sexual image. And before morning, we had peeled off yards of that paper. So, um, Basically, when her husband came to see her, she turns around and said, I've got out at last in spite of you and Jane, and I have pulled off most of the paper, so you can't put me back. Um, so what is Charlotte Goldman's answer to the marriage as an institution that imprisons women? The escape is into insanity, right? Because at the end of this story, she says, now, why should that man have fainted? Well, he did. And right across my pass by the wall so that I had to creep over him every time. So uh, basically this ending suggests to us that there is no realistic escape from the trap of the imprisonment of marriage and insanity is imagined as a different wrong, a only place where women can celebrate triumph um, or enjoy freedom. A similar sentiment then is um, um, expressed by Kate Chopin, who was uh, actually read as a um, writer of local color because she wrote about um, New Orleans, uh, where she, uh, you know, uh, lived after her marriage, and she depicted the, uh, you know, uh, the way people talked 
of that tongue and the many different races and class of New Orleans and Louisiana. That's why she's normally read as a writer of local color, but actually she has a lot to say about this theme um, that marriage is a trap. Um, because if we look at her short story published in 1894, Story of an Hour, this is about a woman who was told that her husband had died. And the whole story is about her emotional reaction to that news. And in this part of the story, we were told that her husband was actually a uh, very kind man, a good husband. She knew that she would weep again when she saw the kind, tender hands folded in death, the face that had never looked safe with love upon her fixed gray and dead. But she saw beyond that bitter moment, a long possession of years to come that would belong to her, absolutely. And she opened and spread her arms out to them in welcome. We should know Chopin's uh, husband actually died, um, uh, you know, and she raised her six children all by herself. And she also began to publish when her children became uh, old enough. She was a very productive writer. And when she wrote the story, this is many years after her husband had died. Um, I suppose the pain of loss had already subsided. And what, what she uh, recorded, at least in this story, is this feeling of a free body and soul free. Um, and of course, ironically, uh, at the end of the story, the woman discovered that freedom that she thought that she could taste at her fingertips was lost. Um, so I will let you read the story yourself. Hopefully I haven't spoiled too much of that for you. The same theme is repeated in the story of the awakening where Etna, a mother of two boys, discovered her sexual being. <laughs> Basically she um, claims in this story um, that I would give up the unessential. I would give my money. I would give my life for my children, but I wouldn't give myself. But after this awakening, after the woman discovered the need to fulfill her own need, um, where, oh, where can she go? Um, at the end of the story, she had no place to go, Atna said by the seashore, she walked into the sea, she never returned. So suicide was her answer. Outside marriage, outside that prison, there wasn't yet a place for a woman to uh, live. So um, another uh, writer of local color would be, uh, you know, Kate Chopin uh, represents the voice of the South. Then we have Sarah Orne Jewett, who wrote about life in good old New England, the North. And in her stories, she uh, her, she focused on the um, daily life, the, the 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 small everyday domestic happenings, but she would enrich these stories with the emotional depth. So that's why um, in her stories, the the um, culture of New England is depicted of ice and fire. Why ice? Because people do not speak to each other much. This is how she describes the language of her area. There is some faint survival of the sound of English of Chaucer's time. People spoke very little because they so perfectly understood each other. Uh, however, right, there's beneath all of these silence, um, this medieval style English, such is the hidden fire of enthusiasm in true New England 
nature that once given out light, it shines forth with almost volcanic light and heat. So uh, this same tradition would be picked up by Robert Frost in his poetry later. Um, and now I will take you to another writer of this era whose work, Little Woman, had recently been turned into a movie that my own daughter enjoyed. Um, myself, I have, have always found Little Woman, the title, a bit diminutive, but the story is based on the biography of Louisa May, a court who uh, actually wrote to support her herself and her mother and her sisters. Her book, Little Woman, sold so well that she lifted her whole family from abject poverty to financial security. So this is why when she was in her 40s, so she published another set of biography titled Work, A Story of Experience, where she wrote, work is a celebration of female liberation and labor of many kinds, including um, liberation, uh, liberation experienced in and from the labor of writing. So earlier on, I uh, mentioned that in James, his protagonist had to return to the prison of marriage even after she realized that she has fallen into a trap. Uh, I have talked about Kate Chopin's um, protagonist. It uh, can only is, uh, escape marriage from uh, through death, such as in Story of Hour and in The Awakening. And I have also talked about Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who wrote about the other escape from marriage is into the realm of the insane. Uh, but at, in, in, Louisa, um, uh, in Louisa May, we actually see another way of surviving as a woman. She, she lived as a um, spinster. She never got married, but financially she was uh, uh, doing fine. She supported herself through work. So she became uh, one of the first generations of women who actually found an outlet, um, an escape from marriage. And um, now I have covered a lot of um, our um, writers from, um, how should I say it, uh, the classical canon. Kit Chopin was discovered in the 20th century, but everybody else was pretty much established in their own lifetime. Um, next, I want to talk about those people who did not benefit from the Industrial Revolution, the Second Industrial Revolution, those, those, those who actually lost their lifestyle because of the Second Industrial Revolution. Because like I said from the beginning of our lecture, today when we look back to the his, uh, history itself and also to history of literature, we need to to um, also preserve the voices of the people um, and uh, not only look at the narratives of the elites. Um, so one of the most important development in America of that period is the building of transcontinental railroad. Uh, which was completed in 1869 that united the East and the West of the United States. So for the first time, people can travel across the country in relatively short period and mail can reach every area of America. Um, in reliable speed. So this was the engine that uh, helped push the second industrial revolution and create the prosperity lots of Americans enjoyed. So this also made it possible for people to get uh, education. The printing press was um, a new thing and paper was cheap. So. Um, uh, everybody can find a readership um, 
So there's quite a lot of private printing press that uh, caters to a special audience. So it was during this period we have uh, uh, Paul Lawrence Dunba who, who, uh, who was considered one of the first African-American writers uh, who wrote actually the very first full-length uh, Broadway, uh, Broadway musical uh, called um, In the Homey. And he uses the um, vernacular language spoken by his people, both in his poems and in his other um, productions. I cannot pronounce this very well myself, so I'm going to play this recording of the poem for you here. Lyrics of Lowly Life by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. A corn song. On the wide veranda white in the purple failing light sits the master while the sun is lowly burning and his dreamy thoughts are drowned in the softly flowing sound of the corn songs of the field hands slow returning. Oh, we hold the corn since the early morn, now the sinking sun says the day is done. All the fields with heavy tread, light of heart and high of head. Oh, the halting steps be labored slow and weary. Still the spirits, brave and strong, find a comforter in song. And their corn song rises ever loud and cheery. Oh, we hold the corn since the early morn. Now the sinking sun says the day is done. To the master in his seat comes the burden, full and sweet, of the mellow minor music growing clearer, as the toilers raise the hymn through the silence dusk and dim to the cabin's restful shelter drawing nearer. Oh, we hold the corn since the early morn. Now the sinking sun says the day is done. And a tear is in the eye of the master sitting by, as he listens to the echoes low, replying to the music's fading calls, as it faints away and falls into silence deep within the cabin dying. Oh, we hold it corn since the early morn. Now the sinking sun says the day is done. The end of A Corn Song, a poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Read by Rick Kistner for Let to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that reading. I would say today um, we have a much richer uh, African American literature. Um, both in um, America and in Africa. Um, but uh, back then, uh, simply to have a voice to depict this lifestyle is already a achievement because these are the people who are forgotten, invisible, and unseen. And so Dunbar do have well, a female um, counterpart who lives in Boston. Her name is uh, Pauline uh, Elizabeth Hopkins. And Pauline runs, like I said, because printing um, business was proliferating and people were getting educated. So Pauline runs her own magazine, which is called The Colored American Magazine. And uh, she published her story um, uh, uh, contending forces, a romance of uh, Negro life, North and South in her own uh, magazine. Uh, so the magazine was uh, in running for uh, uh, about nine years, which is quite a achievement. Her stories can't be uh, described as belonging to the realist school because they are actually romantic tear jerkers. And one of the story ends with a man marrying a woman who was formerly a prostitute because he understands why she chose that line of work. So there's a lot of romanticism in Hopkins' writing, um, but ultimately what she is doing is to express the hope for the future and actually pointing out something that is very real, even though the Civil War was over, even though slavery was officially outlawed, but unless and until 
people's heart and mind about justice change. Um, you know, the racial relations will never be one of true uh, equality. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that's where we can see some realism in her writing as well. Um, so another uh, group of people that really um, should uh, enter uh, the history of American literature, of course, is the Native Americans. And this period produced Alexander Lawrence Posey, who was a poet. And in this poem, Ode to Sequoia, he is writing an ode to the um, Cherokee who invented the Cherokee alphabet, who invented writing. Um, and uh, he is also positioning himself in the poem. Uh, so this is the end of his poem. I'll just read this part for you. Uh, some bard shall lift a voice in praise of the in moving numbers tell the world how man scoffedly, hastily charged with lunacy, and who would not give now honor when at length, in spite of jeers of want and need, thy genius shaped a dream into a deed. By crowd capped summits in the boundless west or mighty river rolling to the sea where thy footsteps led thee on that quest unknown rest the uh, illustrious Cherokee. So he is paying um, respect and honor to the man who invented the written language for his tribe. And he is positioning himself as the one bard who would memorialize this great deed. Um, another voice that we should remember is uh, the voice of Standing Bear. He uh, is again a Native American. Earlier on, I talked about uh, what a vital role the um, Transcontinental Railroad uh, played in the second industrial revolution in American history and how that helped the economy to develop and turn America into an international power. But who were the losers in this? Uh, they are, of course, the Native Americans because the transcontinental, uh, the transcontinental uh, railway disturbed the migration patterns of the buffaloes, and also the Native Americans who occupied the lands um, had to uh, move and. Um, live in Indian um, territories, uh, in, in special territories given to the native peoples. Um, and the tribe uh, Sending Bear belonged to were, give, uh, were uh, ushered into a barren land and they were not given um, farm tools that they needed for survival. And at the same time, they have already lost their original lifestyle of herding buffaloes. Um, so uh, in this move, uh, Standing Bear lost his oldest son named Bear Shield to famine. Uh, so he refused to be moved into the area reserved for Native Americans. And he defended his uh, case in court for the first time. So that is why his speech has became part of uh, Native American um, uh, literary history, uh, where he stood up in court and he said, uh, that hand is not the color of yours, but if I prick it, the blood will flow and I shall feel pain. The blood is of the same color as yours. God made me and I am a man. I never committed any crime. If I had, I would not stand here to make a defense. I would suffer the punishment and make no complaint. So basically this is a speech of Shakespearean uh, caliber and it uh, moved the jury um, uh, at the court and he and his tribe uh, 
got to stay and they didn't have to move into the barren lands that were given them. But not everybody is defending their land and lifestyle in these peaceful ways. Um, we do have a prophet Wawoka, who had a apocalyptic dream where he imagined that the bird, um, the, the, the mystical bird of the Native American people would return and this bird will bring such wind that will cause a dramatic earthquake that will wipe away uh, the white Americans and all of the buffaloes, the dead buffaloes and the native warriors will return and they will reclaim that land. So this prophecy is what give uh, um, the rise to ghost dance songs among many tri uh, tribes of Native Americans. And the white people were frightened of the possibility of all these different um, Native tribes would unite and become a force to be reckoned with. So this movement ended up in slaughter uh, at the Wounded Knee. The sun I'll play you this scene. Into shadow, and I lay dying. And in my death, I saw the heavens of the white robe. Yes, it is as they describe it. But also, there, my children, all the Indians that ever roamed this earth. All your beloved ancestors and mine, and those young ones who were taken by the white man's diseases, do not grieve for them. They want you to know that they are happy Yes. And you should not grieve for yourselves because here is what the white robe did not tell you. The white man, my children, will soon be no more. <laughs> now you must not hate the white man. This will only delay his end. But if you will do the dance that I will teach you, all the ancestors will return and the buffalo will be renewed and you shall all live forever, forever in the freedom that we as Indian people once knew.
So that is the ghost dance song that frightened the white people uh, because it prophesizes the unification of the many native tribes. Uh, and of course, it prophesizes the doom of the white man. Um, this was a nascent religion uh, that you know, began with the words of this prophet that spread that very fast um, during this period, um, but tragically it ended with the massacre of 150 Indian men, women, and children at the Wounded Knee, and that put an end to this nascent religion mm -hmm. and prophecy. So finally, the group of people that I should mention are Chinese Americans, because it was also during this period that the Chinese, the fate of the Chinese and Americans became intertwined. After the slave trade was outlawed, um, actually it was the coolies from China that became the cheap labor that helped build the American railway. Um, that was actually one of the business that supported the development and prosperity of Hong Kong, where I am right now. And many um, coolies uh, from inland China uh, were shipped from the port of Hong Kong to Los Angeles to help um, work uh, at the gold mines and on the railways. And this is... <laughs> Um, the, the, you know, perceived as a yellow peril and uh, also part of the reason why the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act was um, put, uh, implemented in 1882. Um, Chinese were seen as peoples who are not deserving of the freedom of America or democracy. And uh, basically no Chinese immigration were welcomed since 1882. And certainly the Chinese men who were already working in America uh, should not bring their wives uh, with them. Um, so, Finally, I should talk about the two earliest voices of Chinese Americans in um, uh, this period of history. Uh, they are two sisters in, uh, born to the same family of Chinese mother and British father. The younger one of them actually pretended to be Japanese and wrote a series of stories about Japan. And she achieved fame and popularity uh, on Broadway and in Hollywood. The older one of them is um, uh, whom we uh, uh, study uh, Chinese American literature are trying to preserve today. Her name is Shui Xianhua, that's her Chinese name. She uh, totally uh, identified with her Chinese identity and all of her stories were about the Chinese American experience, which were uh, preserved in this collection of short stories called Miss Spring Fragrance. So that's the uh, survey of China, uh, not only Chinese American literature, but American literature uh, in the realist school from 1865 to 1900. Thank you very much for taking your time tonight. And I will stop share screen now. Thank you, Dr. Emma. Thank you. For such a lively interaction and such a lively presentation also how well you have connected the dots in this presentation was something very worth noting thank in you very while much. i interact with dr emma i request the participants to put forward your questions oh okay uh, i will thank be you. moderating it and uh, i will be putting it across to you on behalf okay. of the participants yeah okay. i was I, I was talking about the lively interaction uh, most of the participants who are aware of dr emma i'm sure they are here they 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 join on time 
and some of, of them are new to this presentation. I'm sure all of you all have thoroughly enjoyed Emma's presentation. And we are really happy that uh, Dr. Emma has uh, very well summarized, very well presented and connected the dots in the, in the period which she was discussing, that is the period of realism. And uh, uh, it, is, it is always a pleasure to have Emma on our platform and she has been very kind to spare time for, uh, from her Easter holidays. And as you can see, participant, she's, she's still in her college for this lecture, especially. And it's already 10.30 in Hong Kong. So this speaks a lot about uh, Dr. Emma's dedication. And we are really honored and we thoroughly uh, are thankful for your dedication and for, for a, such a wonderful and lucid presentation. Uh, Thank if you. you comment, Dr. Emma, I will put forward a few questions. What we'll do is uh, we'll put we'll take a few questions. The rest of the questions I will mail you. So we are planning to include these questions along with the book chapter. Uh, if the publisher accepts it, it's okay. Otherwise, we will publish the question answers in a, in a in a different form because some of the questions are very critical, very fresh, and very analytical. As you know, we have a heterogeneous group, so uh, the sessions are most of the time very interesting. Uh, so the first question. Emma, to you is, what are, what are some of the contributions in the field of drama by the realist school? That's an excellent question. Um, actually, uh, basically, in this period, I haven't studied the drama of the period. Um, uh, I know Henry James tried his hands at drama, but it was never very well uh, perceived. Um, Mark Twain was a very successful speaker, uh, both locally and internationally, and he brought humor to the American literature. And if you've been following the course, you know the Puritans don't have a lot of humor. And his uh, stories can be dramatized, um, but uh, he didn't actually write in this genre. Uh, so the um, female writers that we looked at there, um, uh, so their craft is in the short story and the novel genre. And I think the reason we see more flourishing of uh, poetry and uh, novel and short story is because this period is closely connected with the development of printing press. Um, papers are cheap and Whitman is from a family who uh, you know, basically had owned a printing business and same with Mark Twain and they both started their careers as journalists and she had several of the female writers we looked at also worked as freelance journalists uh, as well. So uh, I would say the, 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 the major literary development that was happening um, here is of the, um, poetry, short story, and novel genre, because everybody is educated and it was cheap to buy a book and the book was the chief entertainment of the time. And if you read Henry James, in fact, Turn of the School begins with a man telling his friends stories as they sit by the fireside. So this is actually the way people entertained each other uh, in this era. This is before the era of TV and movies. But remember one of our last Chinese American sisters who eventually became a screenwright um, in Hollywood, uh, the, the younger one who uh, basically, even though her heritage was Chinese, but she positioned herself as a Japanese because Japanese were more uh, favorably perceived uh, at that time and Chinese were being uh, kicked out, right? Basically, I think she is a figure that um, 
connects her period with the next period uh, where we begin to see literature connected with mass culture, with pop culture, with uh, film and uh, TV today. Right? So um, yeah, I, I think Thank maybe you. that's why we don't have uh, a lot of development in drama. Uh, the next question is from Siddhu Tekur. The question is, First, uh, uh, congr congratulations are on your way because of such an innovative and such an engaging way of your presentation. Thank uh, you. Second is, uh, the question is, what's your response to Mark Twain's claim that Walter Scott was responsible for the beginning of the American Civil War? Um, so uh, Mark Twain's claim was, what was responsible for the beginning of civil war? Uh, yeah. Here, um, uh, Walter Scott. Hmm. So uh, did Mark Twain make this claim? I did not know. This is something that I, I, I really should learn uh, from you. Uh, so uh, Walter Scott romanticized the death, right? Give meaning to death and also glorified war. Mm. Did Mark Twain blame the Civil War to Walter Scott? I do not know. Um, but we do know in this period, we also have the naturalist Stephen Queen, who wrote Red Badge of Carriage, uh, who was not part of the realist school. Uh, that's why I didn't have time to cover him. He is naturally considered as the natural school, uh, but he completely changed the depiction of war, even though when he wrote the Red Badge of Courage as a 20 year old man who never been into a war, but he did uh, capture the smallness of the individual in the, um, you know, massive, inhumane um, setting of the war, the, 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 basically the individual falls into the hands of fate, whether you live or die is a matter of luck. Uh, so his depiction of war is basically completely uh, challenges and changes Walter Scott's depiction. But Lincoln blamed um, Uncle <laughs> Tom's cabin uh, for the start of the Civil War, right? Because like Lincoln wanted to um, free the slaves and that novel um, was the first that depicts uh, the slave um, with human dignity, with the ability to know God, with, uh, you know, a, uh, Uncle Tom is a very sympathetic uh, character in, in Stove's novel, uh, but today um, African American readers will not accept that depiction of themselves. Um, uh, so uh, that's that's also part of the reason why we no no longer teach the, that novel, even though we all know the name of it. We we have that Uncle Tom's Cabin. Oh, it's really? Yeah, <laughs> and Uncle Tom's Cabin. We know we read. Uh, Sidhu Tekur adds to what uh, Sidhu Tekur asks that Twain named the sinking boat in Huckleberry Finn after hmm. Walter Scott. Um, so uh, let me see, I'm looking for the question because I didn't quite. Uh, so uh, uh, did you ask um, uh, Huck Finn? Uh, uh, Twain named the sinking boat in Huck Finn after Walter Scott. Oh, thank you. Thank you for for uh, yeah uh, <laughs> for that note. Yeah, it's it's very much in Mark Twain's character, which is poking fun uh, at the establishment, right? So uh, that's that's uh, definitely in his line. And I also saw another really yeah. Great I'll put question. forward last two questions uh, before we put forward last two questions. I just like to remind. Uh, our participants that tomorrow we have two lectures. In the morning, uh, lecture will be on modernism, part one, because modernism will be having two parts. So modernism part one is, is uh, in the morning. And evening we have by Shiji Shamla on postmodernism. Those both lectures will be very engaging. 
so morning we have from 10 o'clock uh, indian standard time uh, emma if you are free please join i know you join some of the sessions you are very interested i know you join mm -hmm. thank you thank you always for joining we really love you join and listen to our lectures and uh, participants so morning 10 o'clock please log in uh, as far as the evening is concerned same timing 6 o'clock but tomorrow is little different we are having a morning lecture from 10 o'clock in the morning which is very important uh, because both those lectures are interconnected so please don't forget because tomorrow is a sunday and mm -hmm. it's morning 10 o'clock uh, we wanted to actually we wanted to have 11 lectures in 10 days because modernism is a huge uh, part and two lectures the resource person also demanded so we will have two modernism one and modernism two uh, the details are already shared with all of you participants uh, we take the last two questions uh, this is and an interesting I... one. Oh, okay pallavi panda asks her question is there any woman writer in during this period of your presentation realist period still using a pen name uh, do you um, know about any woman writer during your period of presentation that is realism realistic period having any using using any pen name because that was something which was very prevalent previous to this age and if not then why did they stop using them oh okay uh, very interesting uh, actually our um, female writers use pen names um I don't quite remember exactly what pen name, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Louisa May used, but she was one of the female writers who used a pen name to publish some of her works. And she was also a very uh, productive writer. Mark Twain itself is a pen name, right, for, for Samuel Connings. Uh, so uh, we have both male and female writer who are using uh, pen names. Um, and the way I perceive it, at least in um, in the earlier period, when women using uh, were using pen names, so they want to hide their gender, and that was a part of the reason uh, I think why uh, sometimes when Louisa May published, she you know she hid her very feminine name, um, and Mark Twain created the pen name Mark Twain to give himself a second personality separate from Samuel Con uh, Clements. Uh, that was his identity as the family man, the, the later businessman, the investor, and earlier the, 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 the journalist. And then Mark Twain is like an alter ego that's poking fun. Um, uh, at himself and sometimes I think this is maybe one of the origins why we have Spider-Man who shoots uh, you know pictures and then give it to his own paper as Peter Parker. Mark Twain did the same thing. He wrote and published the articles under the name Mark Twain and he sent it back to the newspaper he was working for himself. Uh, so that's, uh, the, the, the writers of this period, uh, at least uh, in the case of Mark Twain, used his pen name to create another personality, uh, which is maybe in a way liberating uh, from the mundane. And in Europe, we have Kierkegaard who did the same thing, who published many uh, essays and uh, um, books and their different pen names and each pen name has a different personality to help him work out some of the philosophical musings that he was going through and earlier on i noticed a question that asks a figure that was really important for this uh, period which is william dean house thank you for raising the, this name he's a very important literary critic and his contribution was important to help the public know about Mark Twain and also recognize his uh, achievements. And also he elevated Dunbar's poetry and help um, 
Dunbar's poetry become part of uh, literary history. Uh, so this is uh, actually House was an academic, right? So he, he, he dealt with literary criticism. I don't know whether he achieved literary uh, success himself, but as an academic working in a university, I appreciate somebody today still remember, uh, you know, those who work as critics and not so well known as creators. So, so I appreciate that question. Thank you. Take the last question. Uh, would you look at Whitman as realist with a transcendental attitude or bent or both together? Um, well, um, wow, I think that's very difficult. Um, I, uh, I, I think that's difficult to decide. So for me, Whitman is first and foremost a transcendentalist poet because of the way he thinks of uh, himself as manifested as manifested in everybody and he can um, synthesize with everyone because he recognizes God in everybody and he elevates every life. Uh, so I find that a very transcendentalist attitude. Um, is that a realist? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, I don't think so because like, you know, as a woman, I wouldn't actually enjoy a white bearded man and to say, I am there, I know you, I am you, you live through me. That's, you know, that's not, that's not realism for me. Um, so, uh, so in what way is Whitman realist? I would say that's when we compare Whitman's poetry with say Edgar Allan Poe's poetry. Um, so, you know, Paul grew, uh, was educated in Virginia and he later worked in New York, but you will never be able to guess where he lived and worked because he doesn't talk about these places that he lived and worked. They are not subjects for his poetry. Uh, you know, when you read Once Upon a Midtime Dreary, you don't see his Virginia um, dormitory that is still preserved on the campus of University of Virginia. You don't see the structure of the dorm, the condition. He doesn't write about that, that location, that reality. But Whitman is different. He wrote about the Manhattan Pier. He looked at the people getting on and off the pier. He depicted the people as he see them and he uses the language those people speak. So this this is what makes Whitman more of a realist because he was the first poet who made America a subject worthwhile for poetry. And he's also the first person who elevated the um, Anglo-Saxon vernacular uh, language and preferred that to say Greek, Latin or um, French. Um, you, you know, basically, he if there is a more refined word or a more coarse or a, what would be typically considered as a coarse word, he will go for the coarser word with the English origin rather than something that came from French or Latin. Uh, so again, language-wise and also uh, subject-wise, he is he is a realist in the sense that he captured the language used by the people and also depicted life and, um, uh, you know, life and activities of the people of his period. Thank you so much, Dr. Emma. The boxes uh, behind you, the transparent boxes, remind me of my stay in Bangkok because those boxes are very prevalent in Southeast Asia uh, to document the various documents. And uh, before I conclude, <laughs> before I, I, I can well imagine what's there inside those boxes. Uh, yeah, before we document, uh, before we conclude, I would just like to conclude with one of our participants' quotation, Elroy Robillo. As Elroy puts it, uh, that thank you for this awesome lecture. Love the pace, the use of pedagogy, pictures, videos, audios, and most importantly, your passionate recital of excerpts from various texts. So that is the response that 
uh, our participants have had after your presentation, which clearly testifies the kind of presentation that it was. Uh, so on behalf of Team Dad Voyage, it was again an absolute honor and pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. As usual, your uh, you know pres uh, presentation was loved, appreciated by all, and it definitely uh, gave that input. I'm sure most of the participants will, will get that impetus, go back, reread this particular phase of American history, which is very, very significant. Uh, from also, not only from, uh, from the academic, but also from the various competitive examinations we have in our country uh, for various kinds of jobs and, you know, getting into PhDs and MPhil. So thank you very much for such an insightful lecture on behalf of Team Dad Voyage. It was again an absolute honor and pleasure to have you. And of course, looking forward in the near future, provided you have time and, and uh, provided uh, time permits to have you again on this platform. You always uh, come and add glory to this platform. It's an absolute honor and pleasure always to have you. Thank you so much. Take care. It's late night, I know, in Hong Kong. Please take care. Good night. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for having me again. And it's uh, forever my privilege and pleasure to um, join you. Um, and, and thank you for the audience for taking your time in the evening and uh, join this lecture. And thank you for those amazing questions. And I learned so much uh, from them. Thank you. Take care. Good night. Good night.